brought so basically another Ibn the shock story is Muslims defeated the Jews and wanted their treasure a Jewish man named Kanana knew where the treasure was hidden Ibn Ishaq, page 515. Kanana ibn al-Rabi, who had the custody of the treasure of Banu al-Nadir, was brought to the apostle who asked him about it. He denied that he knew where it was. A Jew came to the apostle and said that he had seen Kanana going round a certain ruin every morning early. When the apostle said to Kanana, do you know that if we find you have it, I shall kill you? He said, yes. The apostle gave orders that the ruin was to be excavated and some of the treasure was found. When he asked him about the rest, he refused to produce it. So the apostle gave orders to Al-Zubair ibn al-Awam, torture him until you extract what he has. So he kindled a fire with flint and steel on his chest until he was nearly dead. Then the apostle delivered him to Muhammad ibn Maslama and he struck off his head in revenge for his brother Mahmud. So Kanana knew where the treasure was hidden, but he refused to tell Muhammad. Muhammad ordered one of his followers to torture Kanana, and Al-Zubair used flint and steel to light a fire on Kanana's chest. This means, of course, that Muhammad affirmed brutal torture as a method of extracting information from one's enemies. Now, we could go into more detail and read about Muhammad taking Kanana's wife, Safiya bint Huyay, for himself after the Battle of Kaibar. So that's the story of Safiya at the hands of the most merciful man. Imam Malik, he told us that this Ibn Ishaq is a Dajjal. He didn't mean the Antichrist, obviously. He said that he, this guy, he is a major deceiver. The point is, Ibn Ishaq was out of his mind. All these stories that he's come up with. Most of them go back to Ibn Ishaq. And what did Imam Malik say? He said, Wallahi, if I was by the Kaaba, I would take an oath by God that this guy is a Dajjal. Four months and ten days you have to wait before you sleep with an, uh, with, with an already married or recently widowed woman. But Muhammad, I don't care who's, who's the daddy. Come on, baby. Come on, babe. That's what Prophet Muhammad was saying. <laughs> You cannot show us proof that Muhammad, when he raped Sophia, and on the same night he had sex with her, that it you happened. It it happened before the ayah came down that you need to wait three months. You cannot prove it. Your imams cannot prove it. Your grand muftis of Al Azhar University cannot prove it. I challenge you, and I challenge your imam and your mufti. That is not what happened. Now, all of these things are nonsense, people. These are all rubbish, right? Now, let me get to the true narrative. The truth is that we have a lot of narrations, a lot. And we've got several in Bukhari. We've got several in other books. Almost all of these narrations to do with this marriage of Safiya come predominant, almost all of them. There may be one or two other ones. Otherwise, generally, they all come through just Anas. There is so much conflict and ittirab. What the muhaddithin call ittirab is when narrations conflict so massively, none of them are reliable. They're in Bukhari, they're in the books of Ibn Ishaq, they're in the books of the Tabaqat, in the Tariq books, in other things. They're there, they're all there and they all conflict. So here are some of the conflicts. Some of them say that no, she was given to Dihya al-Kalbi who the Prophet took her from. Some of these riwayats say that, oh, Dihya al-Kalbi said, I want to take a different slave girl with her. Another narration says, no, he never said that. He said, oh, you can buy her using the seven sabat al he took in place. In some narrations, she was so beautiful that the Prophet took her from Dihya al-Kalbi. Some of them say, well, okay, the Prophet then married her in a place called the uh, Sadduraha. Some of them say, no, he married her in a place called Saddu Sahba, in a different place altogether, right? Okay, some of these narrations say they ca the Prophet and these people came back from Khaybar directly, without any delay, they came to Medina. Other narrations say, no, they came from a different place called Asfan. They'd gone to Asfan instead and they came back from Asfan. Some of them, these narrations say, oh, the Prophet uh, consummated his marriage from that night. Some of them say, no, a few nights later. Some of them say, no, until he didn't get back to Medina. 
that they're coming from this place. No, they're coming from that place. No, they came straight away. No, they took their time. No, they didn't get married till they got back there. No, they did get married when they were there. No, she became Muslim. No, she didn't become Muslim till later on. No, she was still a slave girl. No, she wasn't a slave girl. She was a wife straight away. Oh, no, she did used to fancy the Prophet and she was like this, this story. No, no, she didn't like the Prophet at the day. She No, she was held as a captive from inside the fortress and brought. No, she was actually already standing there. No, she was right. So we've got a lot of nonsense, a lot of noise. Now people have to filter through. Now let me tell you what actually happened, people. First of all, what is very clear is Sophia leaves with the Muslims. This is clear. Fact. Sophia, at some stage in her life, does become the wife of the Prophet. That is a fact. We accept that. These two are facts. It's the things in between that have been mixed up. Now, let me clarify this to you people. First of all, it is impossible that the Prophet married her then. Impossible. Why is it impossible? Because it clearly goes against the Quran. Clearly, clearly goes against the Quran, right? Her husband did die in that battle and that he was one of the chief people and obviously it was a battle. So he did die and he had murdered the brother of Muhammad ibn As Maslama, whose name was uh, Mahmoud ibn Maslama. And it was Muhammad ibn Maslama who killed him in retaliation for his brother. Now the husband had died. Okay, fine. So she's a widow. What does the Quran say about widows? minkum, And those who die amongst you. And their wives are left behind. That they must sit an idda. They must sit an idda of four months and ten days. That once they reach their ajal, they can get married. Allah has said that in the Quran. In the Quran. So the first assumption is that are you saying the Prophet went against this clear verse in the Quran? So some people have tried to say, well, oh no, there was a hadith of Ghazwa to Autas. A female captive can just sit and idda of one menstrual cycle. First of all, that's absurd because the Ghazwa to Autas hadn't even happened yet. It was going to happen one or two years after this event. Two, that was not speaking about widows. Three, there's problems in that chain to start off with. Four, even if you tried to take that understanding of a menstrual cycle, how could it be that same day that the Prophet marries her or the next day, according to these stories? It doesn't make any sense. The, are you telling me the Prophet himself does not know the Quran and he's going against the Quran? So. Okay, let's get that point. So the Prophet did not marry her there. So why are they thinking he married her? Let's go to one of the hadith that Anas transmits. He says, we discussed, we saw Safiya go with the Prophet and we discussed, has he married her? This is Anas saying, because by the way, nobody knew, witnessed this nikah of the Prophet with Safiya. Nobody witnessed it. So Anas in a Sahih hadith says, we asked, so, oh, is she going with him as a captive or is he married to her? And then they see that the Prophet, she sits with the Prophet and the Prophet, and I'm going to get to this, had given her something to cover with. So they assume, they say, oh, because we saw her covered in a dignified way, we she must be his wife. Now they stop at a location where they have a celebration and Anna says, oh, this must be the Walima. Now let me pause here and go back to the, the incident, what's happened. When Khaybar collapses and they had caused a lot of torment to the Muslims and they had murdered several Muslims, what is known about Safiya it, from before, her uncle, her father's brother Abu Yasir had been Muslim for years. He had been a Muslim, Abu Yasir. He visits the Prophet. He is known to have supported the Prophet. He always spoke well of him. There are narrations, Sahih narrations, that Safiya did know about the Prophet. She used to speak well about him. In fact, she had been recently married to this chief for tribal reasons, who she says to him, I had a dream. And she says, in the dream, I saw a moon landing in my lap. 
She never mentions the Prophet's name or anything. What does her husband say? He says to her, you are obsessed with that Muhammad. She doesn't mention the Prophet Muhammad's name. He says, and he's the person you want to be with. And he punches her up so bad that she is actually bruised. In the hadith, Sahih hadith, once again, when she, in the battle of once the battle of Khaybar is over, she comes to the Prophet. Her eye is all green with bruises. And the Prophet asks her, Why, what happened to you? And she says, Kinana beat me up. And the Prophet asks her, why? And, and, and she says, because I had this dream. Now, obviously, a lot is going on because there's a whole battle. Everything has settled, things like this. People make disparaging comments about her. People say, oh, Yahudiya, Yahudiya, Jewish woman, this, that. And the Prophet tells them off. He tells them off. This is in a Sahih Hadith. He tells them off. Some people held her as a captive. They wanted to hold her as a captive. The Prophet freed her. He did not marry her. He freed her. Now, because people were showing animosity towards her, the Prophet said to her, ride with me. There's several other hadith where the Prophet has gone on his camel and he's gone past Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr, seen her walking, carrying, and he said, listen, why don't you get on the camel with me? Come with me. And she says, no, I don't want. These kind of things were common. That's a Sahih hadith about Asma. So the Prophet says to her that, listen, you ride with me. And it mentions in the hadith that you hawwilaha that al abaa that he got a cloth and laid it out on the camel for her to sit. And it mentions he kind of bowed his knee. The Prophet, this is in a Sahih hadith. The Prophet bowed his knee and she stepped on his knee and climbed onto this camel. When people are being so rude to her, this was the akhlaq of the Prophet towards her. He did not marry her. He did not. He freed her, told them off from abusing her, said to her, listen, why don't you ride with me? Because they were abusing her because she was obviously a Jew, Jewish person. She, and they obviously just had this huge battle and himself lowers for her to step on his on his knee and climb onto this camel. When in the Sahih Hadith, when they're coming back, the, they have an incident where the camel falls over and the Prophet hurts himself as well. And it's a well-documented incident. I mean, not severely, but he hurts himself. And she falls off. And what does the Prophet do? And remember, this is her in this kind of devastated state. The Prophet gets his cloak and puts it round her and covers her. This is in the Hadith. He did not marry her. Now they come back to Medina. Look at the way the akhlaq that the Prophet had demonstrated towards her. She would have been naturally somebody in her idda. The Prophet has not approached her. Anas is assuming because she's riding with the Prophet and because the Prophet is showing this, oh, maybe she's married to him. Because he says, we discussed, is she married to him? Is she his captive? What's going on? They don't know. When they stop at Saddus Roha, they mention during Khaybar, by the way, they laid siege to these fortresses. They were starving. Muslims were starving at some of the fortresses. They mentioned that they were so, because it was so difficult for them. They didn't have that much preparation. Now, even though they did get food and stuff when they had conquered, when they stopped, they have a feast for victories. So they have some food. Now, Anas assumes, oh, is this because he got married? This is an assumption. This did not happen. There was no nikah that took place. It would have been haram. She was in her idda anyway. And the Prophet had not, she hadn't even embraced Islam. It doesn't make any sense. But yes, she was sympathetic to the Prophet from before because her uncle who was very dear to her loved the Prophet. And remember, she used to get beat up by her husband because he used to assume that, oh, she took a liking to the Prophet. When she gets back to Medina, the Prophet told her, why don't you stay at such and such a person's house? She didn't live with the Prophet. She stayed with Umm Salim and with other people in their house. This is what the books show. Now, in that time, even Aisha radiallahu anha and other people made some derogatory comments towards her. And the Prophet told them off. They said about, oh, that Jew. And the Prophet said, don't say that. What's wrong with you people? Why are you being like that towards her? Now, during, after this time, as time goes on, she does embrace Islam. She sees 
this kind of in because think about it in this in this might of victory the attitude of the prophet towards her even when he saw her at Khaybar with a green bruised eye and he doesn't amidst all this confusion he asks her hey what what happened to you i mean did one of the muslims do this and she says no it was my husband beat me up then saying hey come with me stay because he saw some of them were mocking her then covering her when she fell off the camel giving her a place to stay he did not marry she does embrace islam in time to come in the months that followed she does and then she herself is interested in the prophet and they do get married that is a fact but it is inaccurate inaccurate to assume that this all happened in one night in the battle of khaybar it is absurd because there's no way she embraces islam and does this and she sits her idda and she does this and she does that it doesn't make any sense so these were some of the key points I wanted to mention that look yes it is true that she did marry the prophet but marriage requires consent in Islam everybody accepts that she married the prophet she would have had to consent to that and Anas being the key transmitter somebody who's 16 years old at the time and people transmitting from him over his lengthy lifetime these things have become subjected to interpretate. There were so many clashing narrations from Anas, countless, all contradicting each other. So what you have to do, and he does mention these things. Anas mentions, oh, I saw the prophet uh, lay out a cloth for her. I saw the prophet put out his knee and she stepped on his knee. This is all Anas. Anas transmits that, oh, I saw that her eye was beaten up and, and the prophet was talking to her. I saw this kind of stuff. And other people transmit some of these stories about Khaybar as well in these incidents now what's interesting is when the Muslims get back and they're celebrating and they've got all these spoils of war Abu Huraira has arrived and what does Abu Huraira say he says from the battle of Khaybar they didn't bring anything he says Ma ghanimu lam yughnam. there was not taken as spoils of war except illal ghanam wal baqar wa thiyab except clothing cows and sheep this is Abu Huraira's hadith. Hadith come to us, there's many hadith. Sometimes they conflict, especially on historical accounts, because these things didn't get documented till generations later. So when it's something very important like this, you have to weigh it up against the teachings of the Quran to start off with. What does the Quran say? How it is impossible that the Prophet is preaching to people about idda, women, widows have this idda, but then himself is like, hey, take Sophia, it doesn't matter. That is impossible. It is impossible that all these things happen, all these narrations, which are all in books like Bukhari, and they all contradict each other. That, you know, no, this person has a no, he buys her with this, no, he buys her with that, no, they stop here, no, they don't stop here, no, they celebrate here, no, they don't celebrate here, they, they get married straight away, no, they don't get married straight away, no, they marry in Medina, no, they marry in this place. They can't all be, yes, there's some truths and you have to analyze these things. I mean, have you even analyzed what's going on? Have you even looked at the text? They conflict with each other. Wallahi, it is not true. This is what I'm saying. And you say, yeah, but it's in Bukhari. But there's so many conflicting narrations in Bukhari about this incident. You're telling me the Prophet got married and nobody but Anas knew. Only Anas knew that. And even Anas himself in Bukhari, in these narrations, is saying, oh, we weren't sure. Did he get married? Didn't he get married? Because there were no witnesses. So he says, I don't know. Let's, he says, let's wait if he covers her up. That means it's his wife. No, it doesn't mean that. That may have been an interpretation. So I hope inshallah this makes some sense and we have to look afresh at things.